doing here today then? Well, it doesn't sound too pretentious. I'll just uh, demonstrate a few little uh, tips and tricks I've learned over the years. I do most of my own motorcycle maintenance, you know, sort of uh, routine stuff. And uh, I've got a little, a few little tips I've picked up over the years. And I'll be doing some brake bleeding and with a method that might be new to some people and a dead easy DIY torque wrench solution. Brake lines of course are essential vehicle safety features and it it's only so happens that that's what I'm working on today to show these techniques. Not that these are recommendations, they're just merely how I do it. And if you have any concerns about uh, vehicle safety and maintenance, then use a proper torque wrench or get a recognised service station to do the work for you. So I've got my little Bedouin encampment set up. I haven't got a fancy garage or anything. I think it's going to rain later, so the bike I'm working on is a Suzuki Freewind 650. But the techniques I'm going to be using are applicable to any machine or motor vehicle. So I'll be doing some bike specific stuff later in the video, but what I'm going to show you now is generic to all brake systems and torque wrenching applications. I've already made a start of replacing the brake lines at the same time as doing the uh, rear caliper shoes. I've done the front brake lines last year so it's all quite recent. Now this bike incidentally it's 19 years old now. It's coming, I've had it from brand new and uh, I was thinking it would be good wouldn't it to do a 20 year review, that will be next year on this machine. <laughs> yeah, so I, was, I was thinking that uh, only having it for 19 years you see it might be a little bit too early to tell if it's any blinking good or not. So I thought I'll give it a 20 year review next year which will give it some long term, long standing ownership authority so to speak. 19 years. That's just too soon. <laughs> and because the bike is coming up to 20, we could regard all this new gear as a bit of a birthday present. But of course, we don't want to tell the motor mule about it just yet. And my understanding is that if you don't have the key in, it can't hear what you're saying. So it will come as a surprise when I tell it it's got new shoes, <laughs> new brake lines, and all that kind of thing. So. Don't let in on the secret. Okay then, let's whip that seat off. Get it out of the way and get into it. Of course, this isn't the key that enables it to hear things. This is just uh, the seat key, not the ignition key, so that doesn't matter. So the first thing I'm going to do is whip off the uh, reservoir cap and suck out the old juice. Here we go then. Now the manufacturers say you should change your brake fluid every two years. I'm not that assiduous but I do do it for about every four years. Because uh, brake fluid is hygroscopic, picks up water. You know, it just gets old and manky. So, yeah, with the age of this machine, this is maybe the fourth or fifth time I've done the rear one. The rear one's a bit more awkward to get to because you've got uh, panels to get off and all that kind of thing. That's the cap. And I want to suck out the old juice before purging it through the new brake line and into the new seals and the, in the uh, caliper. That I've got so I've got this squeezy bottle, it's just a, a fairy liquid bowl with some hoses going on the thing onto the end. And if you can crush it like that, you'll then create a vacuum which will enable you to go. And there she is. And of course, it's much easier to take it out of the reservoir like this 
rather than pumping it through laboriously till you get fresh fluid going in. I'll just give it another little catch in the, in the bottom there, get as much of the dregs out as I can. There, I think we can save safely that that is as empty as one can get it. Now we pour a freshly opened bottle of DOT4 brake fluid. Just pour that in. I know I'm obscuring the camera doing this, but forgive me. So I'm going to fill that up to the top. I'm going to leave the cap off for now because I'm going to be purging the fluid through. I didn't want to pump the master cylinder, which is there. That's the master cylinder attached to the brake mechanism. I don't want to pump that until I've got fresh fluid in, in the reservoir because you don't want to pump your master cylinder dry. It wants to have fluid in it all the time to maintain the hydraulic action. So, now... So now I'm just going to pump the brake pedal a few times. So I just want to get all the old juice through the system and out before I reassemble it, the new brake line to the caliper. Keeping an eye all the time, of course, not to empty the reservoir, because like I said, if you, if you drain that down and get the master cylinder dry, then you'll, you might have all sorts of problems getting it pumping again. What I'm doing now is just purging the old brake fluid so we've got new and fresh stuff throughout the system. I've just got a little, you can't see it in the camera, but I've got a little drip tray here that I'm just pumping it into. Of course, while you do this, keep an eye on your reservoir level. That make sure that that's sort of, uh, got a decent amount of fluid in it all the time. So I've just clipped up the end of the brake line to stop it uh, weeping through. And I've got the new, oh, the old caliper with a new piston in it. I'll show you why a little later on. New shoes, and of course the motorcycle hasn't got the key in, so it can't hear me telling you that this is an early 20th birthday present. You've got a little stainless steel slipper and that's the one it came off, you see, so the profiles are the same. <sighs> Important to get that on the right side. And the new pads, the material, 6mm thick, I've measured it, 6mm thick it is on the new ones. Look how low it blinking was on the old one, this is why I've got new shoes. Now this was on the side that you couldn't see and the, the shoes had worn a little unevenly. The one you could see had more meat on it than that and you thought, oh, it'll do for another year maybe, do you know what I mean? But actually, I'm dissembling it. Bugger all, nearly down to metal. That's terrible. Deary me. Naughty boy me. <laughs> so I've just reassembled the new brake pads to the caliper. And I've just simply put the top bolt in and on that top bolt I've used a tiny little bit of copper grease. I'm not going to use copper grease on the other sliding ways as I'll explain in a minute. There we have the caliper just loosely positioned. I've spread the shoes to slip them, the pad sorry, to slip them over the disc making sure that the tail ends are in their proper little niche. Niche. Now for the bolts which assemble this onto the uh, mounting I'm going to be using this special Suzuki brake grease. It's a silicon grease, okay. It's quite expensive but I was fed up with the, uh, what do you call them? You know, the, the blinking sliding ways and everything getting pinched and tight. They need to move freely so I thought I'd treat treat these jobs to the, to the proper special grease which will keep the bellows and everything running sweet. 
it's raining now. <laughs> so here's that little wee tub of grease. I think it costs, can't, it's been a long time, it said 2012 on it, on the package, didn't it? I think it was either £8 or £16, either way. It's expensive stuff, you know, because it's only a little pot. But if it's the proper thing and keeps your brakes running sweeter for longer, then it's all good with me. And I'm taking the other one. I've just cleaned these bolts up. Ready to go in fresh and fresh and bonny. A bit of grease. Don't need much of it, you know, it's just uh, I suppose in case any other rubber might react with the rubber bellows material or something like this. Now this one's a bit more fiddly because you've got to line it up with a gator inside. Right, I think I've got that started. I do hope so. I'll get my sockets out in a minute and, and do that. So separate the pads again. Oh, it fell out. There we go. Can I get this other one in there? Yeah, it's all, it all looks a bit fussy on camera, presumably, but, uh, you know, it's, it's easier in real life than trying to explain it, I think. One of those things. There we have it then. Just Everything's just sort of hand-tight installed. We'll do the full torque-up stuff in a bit. But I just wanted to show you this. Now I've got a new HEL brake line, okay, and the fittings it came with, that's the new one, stainless steel, that's the old one, and you can see that the threaded portion is a little shorter, okay, now because there's less thread length engaged in the housing, I'm going to be a little extra sympathetic with torque values when we come to that point. You understand there's there's probably a whole pitch less thread on there I reckon on the new one here we are again everything's just loosely assembled that's just knit tight enough to stop the fluid weeping through but everything's assembled like I say we'll do the torque down later on I did measure the washers actually the washers are no thinner than the previous ones so there is definitely less thread engagement length inside the housing and that's why talking is important, of course, because you don't want to blinking overdo it, do you? Anyway, I think we're in a position now to start the bleed through. Okay, this is the bleeding trick. So here's that <laughs> washing up bottle again. And of course, if you squeeze it in and then put the, the hose on the nipple, then because this is in a sort of sucking mode, it's obviously not going to admit air into the nipple as we do the bleeding because it's always sucking and of course should it get to a point where this is less deformed and exerting less vacuum and of course we'll pinch off the nipple again oh, tighten it up take this off squeeze it reapply it and then it's got another bite of the cherry is, if you like so I've used a ring spanner to crack uh, to crack you know what I mean to, bre to break the stiction of of the nipple bolt and once you've sort of uh, eased it a little you can then just use an open-ended spanner just to tease it open while you do the pumping thing and now I'm pumping on the on the brake pedal and with luck if my hands not in the way you should be able to see the, the fluid rising in the tube And evacuating the air. Just make sure that stays on there, of course. Whilst at the same time keeping an eye on your reservoir, because you don't want to drain that dry. I topped it up before we got to this stage. I'm not sure if I've opened that nipple enough, actually. I may have done. It just might be all the air inside the. Yeah, that's better. Can you see that fluid rising up around the tube? Keeping an eye on the, ma on the master reservoir as well. And of 
course we had earlier purged the old fluid through the tubing anyway so all this is good new stuff so I'm pumping away on the foot brake pedal and with each descent it's plunging some new fluid through the master cylinder and then into the tubes and down to the rear brake caliper and what sometimes takes the time here is, of course, is because the piston chamber is completely empty you've got to extend the piston onto the pads and onto the disc and now each time I pump I can feel a little sort of uh, a fluid response to the caliper as all that space is filled by fresh fluid expanding the piston. I've got the nipple uh, pinched off at the moment because it's filling the caliper housing. But do you see what I mean about the bottle? You know, it's like if you're going like that with your cheeks, except the bottle's doing that, uh, that sort of suction business, which you wouldn't want to do with a mouthful of uh, blinking brake fluid, would you? <laughs> Hope she'll, hopefully she'll tighten up shortly. And then we can get round to purging the last of the air bubbles out of the, uh, out of the piston vessel. I'll bring you back when I get there. Okay, so I think we're at the stage where the uh, piston chamber is full of fluid. It's just a matter of getting out the last air now, and then it will do its hi proper hydraulic thing. So whilst pumping, I just crack the nipple open a little bit, and uh, hopefully, You can see the bubbles migrating around the YouTube. Can you see that? I don't know. The reservoir is still about half full, so that's good. You have to keep that in mind whilst you're doing all this business. So it's air all along the new brake pipe in the housing itself. Now I can't feel it coming hard yet. Although the brake fluid is still going down in the mast in the reservoir, so it's still going going through. You can see that, that bubble on the crown there. There we are, we're getting some throughput now. I just haven't opened the nipple far enough before, I don't think. I'll give it a pinch off and have a rest. <laughs> so I'm just going to take another bite of the cherry, as it were. Squeeze the bottle. Whack it on the nipple. Just uh, unseat the bleeding nipple a little bit. Hey, it's gloomy under here. As it's been spitting with rain, so it's a good job I got the right size, 8mm, yeah. So it's a good job I put this little tent up to keep me sheltered. Here comes the fluid, do you see that? Up she comes, up she rises. <laughs> yes, I've been having a little camping expedition doing this with a motor meal. Don't tell Poppet I've had a camping expedition without her, in case she's upset. I'll just nip it up a little bit and generate a little bit of uh, hydraulic pressure in there. See that bubble coming round the top? Can you see that? There she goes. And over she spills. Bubble free, doesn't it? 
Oh no, there's another one just little popped up. A little tiny little one. Just pinch it up and see if I can generate a hard pressure on the, the brake pedal now. open a little more, there goes a, a good meniscus going over the top yeah, it's all looking pretty pure I think it's just a matter of me just uh, footing it on the brake pedal now for a bit until the pistons harden up against the disc and when it gets to that point I'll then do another finishing bleed as it were Oh yeah, I think I can feel it tightening now, properly. Hydraulic lock up if, if you like. Ah. Okay, so give the brake pedal some quick, quick spurts, quick presses. Nip it off, did you see those bubble bubbles rising? Another few quick actions on the brake pedal. She's all done. Okay, I think we're going to do the talking business now. Now this will get a little bit, uh, a bit classroom for a few minutes. So if anyone wants, wants to sort of. Uh, uh, go to sleep or your eyes glaze over then that's fine but come back to me in a minute because uh, we'll be applying the talking but like I say first a little bit of the science behind it okay so stuff about torque then just some simple diagrams here now comes the, cl the classroom bit we need to understand equilibrium of forces and moments diagram one just shows like a seesaw with an equal distance either side to an equal mass of one. The moment is the product of the distance times the force. 1x equals 1x. Diagram 2. We have a system which would appear at first sight to be out of balance. We need to check whether the anti-clockwise forces equals the clockwise forces. We have a mass or a force of 10 at a distance of 1. What would be the weight we need at the other side? Well, the product of the moments of the force times the distance on one side, 1 times 10, 10 and 1, divided by the distance on the other side, 5, gives us 2. So at a distance of 5, a force or a mass of 2 would balance a mass or a force of 10 at a distance of 1. Diagram 3. Again, we need to check that the moments balance the anti-clockwise forces equals clockwise forces and instead of drawing a seesaw with a fulcrum in the middle we now have the shank of a bolt or a fastener. On one side we have a load of 10 at a distance or lever of 1. This would represent the friction of the screw threads and the clamping force required. On the other side, we have a distance of 4. What would be the load required to equal the forces on the anticlockwise side? side? Well, again, a force or a load of 10 times the distance of 1 divided by the distance on the other side gives us a load of 2.5. Because it's a longer lever arm, it needs less force to apply the same load at a shorter offset on the other side. 
Now, of course, these forces I'm talking about could be kilograms, newtons or pounds. As long as they are the same units on either side, it all comes into balance. One newton equals 0 0.1 of a kilogram, as near as damn it. Ten newtons equals one kilogram. Twenty newtons equals two kilograms. One kilogram actually equals 9.81 newtons, but 9.81 is close enough for, to 10 for our purposes. Of course, having a spanner length of 4 meters, for example, is an impractical proposition. So what happens if you have a shorter lever? What does it do to the forces? Diagram 4. Again, on the anti-clockwise side, we have a load of 10 at a distance of 1. That could represent a torque required value of 10 newton meters. On the other side, we have a distance more representative of the length of a normal spanner, 0.25 meters or 250 millimeters. What force would we have to apply to that spanner of 0.25 meters long in order to equate to 10 newton meters? Well, again, anti-clockwise moments equals clockwise moments. We have 10 times 1 divided by 0.25 equals 40 we would have to apply a force of 40 kilograms or 40 newtons to equate to required torque of 10 newton meters or 10 kilogram meters. Are you getting me so far? Okay, talking on the machine now. Now who was paying attention and who wasn't? I guess we'll find out. So the spanner for the master cylinder and the slave cylinder, you can't quite see that in shot can you, but where it attaches to the brake caliper, 14 mil spanner. I've just been and looked up the torque values and all the bolts I'm going to do today actually, the big bolts anyway, are 23 newton meters. Now you remember we were saying that uh, one kilogram equals 9.81 newtons let's round it up and call it 10 so one kilogram equals 10 newtons 23 newton meters divide that by 10 equals 2.3 kilogram meters okay kilogram meters next we take our spanner we measure the length of it Do you remember the lever arms on the seesaw you know, well, I don't know if you can see that there, it's 220 mil center to center. Okay, I'm gonna call that 250 mil just because it divides into a meter, which is a thousand mil quite easily. So I'm gonna say that this spanner is in the magnitude of one quarter of the length of one meter. That means I need to amplify those torque values by a factor of 4 to get equivalency to me applying 23 newtons at 1 metre length. I haven't got a metre spanner, I've got one which is 1 quarter of a metre. Okay. Oops. Made it so the way I measure my force is with one of these, what do you call them, a spring balance, fishing balance? It's graduated in pounds and kilograms. So I can measure the amount of force I'm applying at any one point to these fastenings. So there we have it. 14 mil spanner on the master cylinder. But the hook for I just use for hook, the, the cork I mean, just as a safeguard against put that on the other way around so I can see the gauge, that'd be handy wouldn't it? Yep, yep. 
Yeah, I put the cork on just in case there's a slip so you haven't got a jagged thing going into your wrist or something. So start gradually applying a force. It's on 3 kilograms, 4 kilograms, 5 kilograms. I'll just have a stop there. I'm just going to remind myself what the figures are. 23 Newton meters equals 2.3 kilogram meters. So I'm wanting to multiply them by 4 because the spanner is one quarter or one fourth of a meter long, which means I'm going to be going to 8, 9.2 kilograms. 9.2 kilograms torque, okay? But do you remember I mentioned the fact that the thread engagement was a little bit less on the fasteners which came with this hose? So I'm going to reduce it a little bit. So instead of 9.2, I'm going to go sort of 7.58 kilogram meat, 8 kilogram force region. Okay, apply the spanner again, whack the cork back on, and it's important to make sure that the spring force is always perpendicular to the axis of the spanner. You know, if it was pulling at an angle, you'd get a false reading. It needs to be pulling perpendicular to the spanner and the axis of rotation of the bolt. So here we go. I'm just putting a finger on there to make sure the spanner stays on snug. And we took it up to five before. We're now at six. 6.5. Oh, 7.5. Think that'll do. Gonna do the same now to the slave cylinder. Where is it? there and here's where the hose connects to it so again it's, up, it's the same torque the same spanner so it's the same values I'm going to be using okay let me turn this gauge around so perhaps you can see it on the, on the screen I don't know if we can contrive that so again pulling perpendicular to the axis of the spanner and just putting a finger on there to ensure that the spanner doesn't come off. I'm not sure if you're going to see that on the telly, as it were. I'm having a hard job reading it myself because the light is getting poor. Oh! Like I say, dead cheap and cheerful, and yet not unnecessarily inaccurate DIY torque wrench. Which way? I'll do it that way around. Five kilos. 6 kilos, 7 kilos, I'm just going to get another bite on the spanner so I'm maintaining a perpendicular pull because that is important, getting the vector of pull correct can you see that there? 7, 8, that'll do me that'll do me now of course if you're working on a tractor big vehicle where all the fastenings are drawing into good steel or cast iron you might want to handball the you know the, the, the tightening of fastenings and feel fairly secure that you're not going to strip out threads but of course uh, I think the caliper is die cast material I'm not sure it's definitely not steel or cast iron it'll be some sort of aluminium alloy and so you do want to be careful not to strip threads, don't you, by over tightening things. So that's where having a means of gauging the torque that you're applying is important. So you can feel secure and happy that it's tight enough, but not over tight, that you've done some damage, snap the bolt off, you know, because that causes aggro and expense and delays then, doesn't it? So there we go. Just a fishing spring balance cost a couple of quid on a market or a tool stall or something like that. I brought out my bigger one because I wasn't sure till I worked out the sum what the value is going to be but but for bigger for bigger torques obviously you can use the next size up and I've got an even bigger spring balance as well. Never used that in a, in a tightening application though. And I've got these bolts to do here as well that hold the caliper to the mounting and I've also got to do the little uh, allen key top pin for the pads. I'll torque all them up, but I'll be using exactly the same principle. 
just scaling it up or down as the case may be for the actual torque value required versus the spanner length or tool that I'll be using. So I hope that's been a reasonable explanation of the uh, DIY home job <laughs> torque wrench. Okay. Well, I just thought I'd show you this other application as well, how you can be a little bit adaptive with this uh, torquing method. See in there there's an Allen head, an Allen key head screw. I've just been and got the uh, the torques for the lesser bolts, and this is the pin bolt, 18 newton meters. Okay, 18 newton meters equals 1.8 kilogram meters. Remember what we said in the classroom. <laughs> so I'm going to measure now. That Allen key tool is just under 200 mil long. I'm going to call it 200 mil. That's one fifth of a meter. Okay, so I'm going to have to amplify the values by five. You knew that already because you were assiduous students. Just do that again. 200 mil, as good as as good as near as. 1.8 newton meters equals 1.8 kilograms. Five times 1.8 is five plus. 5 times 8 is 4, 9, 9, ki nine kilogram, in terms of this it works out to a 9 kilogram force is what I'm trying to say, <laughs> have I got that right, let me just check, 1.8 kilograms times it by 5, because this is 1 fifth of a metre, 5 times 2 is 10, 5 times 1.8, 9, yeah. So again, again, we'll put that in the hole. Put our little safety cork on, can you see that? And you see there's a little ball head recess there, which just allows me to hook that in there hold it securely, whoops, hold it securely in and apply a value. Now I've run out of space underneath the sides so I'm going to have to go around to the next, the next facets. Where is it? Come on. Okay, find the next one down. That's a bit of a bugger. It fouls. This is a bit, a bit of a nuisance because I'm running out of vertical. <laughs> This is real and live action, you see, not rehearsed or not doing cuts and stuff. Let's see. Perhaps if I grip the body of it, I'll have the space to apply what they say. I can go for nine. Nine. Oh, dearie me. Right, get some load on. Try it. Let me try it upside down then. Because maybe that hook is skewing it. Again, I'm running out of space under under the, the silencer to get a. Uh, we're sitting nine on the scale. It's a little bit off angle to what I was saying earlier, but that's only because of the physics of the machine. Or oh, maybe I can get another bite in there now. Yes, I can. Because because we've turned it a little more, I can get another. Oh, you can see how this can be fiddly, can't you? <laughs> but even if it. Oh, Deary, deary me, I'm probably blocking my own view as well, aren't I? Come on this side. Is that better? Maybe. So, put it screen side up, gauge side up, I mean. Pull it 90 degrees. Yeah, that's nine. See? You can use it on the. You can adapt the, me the method to, to suit all sorts of fasteners. I've got the torque value written down for the nipple as well. 
much lesser value but I'll be using a smaller spanner so I'll have to times it up by even more like maybe six times but like I say it's important to do that right I'll, I'll do the nipple when I've let the whole system settle a little bit and bleed out some more some more air so that's right right well this says XF650 is pretty much like uh, an urban an urban trailey version of the DR, the Suzuki DR600. So some of these uh, bits and bobs I've been doing here today could well be common. I don't know for sure, but could well be common to the DR650 as well. And uh, yeah, I'll get into some XF650 specific observations while I've been doing this in a minute. But just before I get to that, I'll just say I'm often a fool to myself that uh, I don't often say in my videos that if you found this in any way useful, um, I don't know, edifying, amusing even, then give us a thumbs up and maybe even subscribe and, and uh, polite and courteous comments will all be, always be answered. You know, if anyone politely wishes to tell me I'm doing it all wrong and what an idiot I am, you know, then you're welcome. Keep it polite, of course, you know, but that kind of thing. Yeah, so. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention this. It's beginning of November and it's about half past three in the afternoon. It's so gloomy and overcast, that's why it's so dull. But just for this later little bit, I decided to bring the portable light out so I could see what the bloody hell I was doing. Anyway, we'll catch up in a bit about some XF650 specific bits and bobs. Okay. Well, blow me. Just discovered my portable light's got magnets on its feet so I can stick it to the frame. How good is that? Gave it a few quick pumps. And I opened the cock and out, out burst a load of bubbles. And it's just getting progressively better and better. Can you see that? Yeah, it's good and hard. It's good and hard as it should be. There you go. Give it a few more a few more pumps. Keeping an eye on the reservoir of course. Yep, she's all good and hard up now. Pistons are biting and everything. It's just getting too dark now. I'll have to do the other stuff on another day. <laughs> but anyway, we've got some progress done, haven't we? Okay. Final top up of the uh, fluid reservoir now. <coughs> and note the rag because uh, brake fluid can affect paintwork. A drip there for example. My bike's leaning over a bit so I'm just gauging what the level will be what it when it's upright. That will do us. Then we present the freshly cleaned cap with the writing <laughs> legible from the front of course. <laughs> and screw it down. Now I've got in the habit of preparing all my fasteners, that's the little screw, one of them, with petroleum jelly. Just a little smear of that on each thread. It's neutral, neutral and kind to all sorts of materials including metal and it just prevents that sort of rust stiction on any fasteners which you might not undo for years and years and years. There'll just be a layer of moderate grease there to prevent the, the stiction going on. These screws don't get torqued down, you just tighten them down sufficiently. Not over tight of course, but you know, just nice and snug. 
when it comes to these side panels and covers you get these little rubber spikes which engage in grommets and there's one under there and to keep it sweet and fluid just put a little bit of fairy liquid on it helps ease it in and assists with the next time you come to take it off as well there's a little spigot under there as well just like when you're doing a put the tyre on snap on. Where's my thingy? There she is. Just like that. Again, being a fuss pot, a bit of petroleum jelly on the screw threads. keep it sweet for next time. Brake lines, of course, are essential vehicle safety features and it it's only so happens that that's what I'm working on today to show these techniques. Not that these are recommendations, they're just merely how I do it. And if you have any concerns about uh, vehicle safety and maintenance, then use a proper torque wrench or get a recognised service station to do the work for you. This is a week later incidentally, the weather has improved so I don't need my tent structure. And we're talking specifically now about the XF650 Freewind Suzuki bits and bobs. That's what it is, a Suzuki Freewind. And it's a 650. And it's largely based upon the uh, Suzuki DR600. Now here's the thing with that replace replacement brake line. You see in there, where the new brake line goes, there's the suspension spring. That's going to be boiling up and down, of course, in transit. And also, there's the exhaust both of which are very unfriendly to essentially a rubber lined or coated brake line. There's, there's the exhaust. Now on the old brake line it had this uh, heat shielding and I've got my finger on there which I managed to get off the original brake line and put on this one so there's a start but there's still the potential for a bit of uh, misalignment of the brake tube, the brake line, to end up within the spring, I imagine. So I've got to uh, address that somehow. I'll come back when I've thought of something. Now, regarding this issue, 
with the brake line, I had noticed when I was installing it that there was quite a bit of twist needed to get the banjos to line up. Okay, now I had some misgivings about that at the time, but it transpires that the twist that you have to induce into the brake line to align those banjos results in a resultant twist at this end which naturally wants to keep the tube out of the suspension spring so with that heat protector on there I'm gonna say that's okay for now and keep an eye on it now this is the replacement brake line that I've got HEL and this is the original. Now do you see how the original, the Suzuki OEM pipe, has a preformed kink which would resolve those issues regarding the suspension spring and the exhaust. And of course that heat shield element, which I've taken off here and put on the new, was round about here. But you note the sort of general alignment or extent of misalignment of the banjos. Well, I think I'll keep this as a pattern in case I want to ultimately go for a builder line set next time or indeed get a new original at some point if I have any issues with that tube coming into contact with the exhaust or the suspension spring. But that's something to think about if you're replacing your lines, you know. The original is fully sorted in that regard. Now, I've taken the caliper off and took it down to the bike shop for them to put new seals in. And they also put in a new piston. You see how scored this piston is. Because the, the old seals had dragged out. It had been exposed to the weather for quite a long time. piston got scored so a new piston was put in and seals by the shop for me to reassemble when I brought it home again. These are the XF650 rear brake shoes and you can see this one has got this little uh, stainless shim on it so the just clip around the sides there, can you see that? Where, where is it? Oh, there we are. <laughs> see, if, see how it clips under. Again on that side there. And that's how it goes, so the U-shape points down from the top hanging pin, as it were. So, that's just making a record, so for when I reassemble with new shoes. And again, XF650 rear brake caliper. I just want to record the orientation of that little spring shim under the single piston. Can you see that it's got the serrations towards the, the outer side as it were. I hope this is going to be useful to me on reassembly. By which I mean I've only got one bloody hand free but where my little finger is, this end you see, it's got the, the fingers which obviously engage with the outer shoe and the other bit engages with the inner shoe depending on how much wear there is etc etc ah, hope the light is sufficient to reveal that in all its pertinent detail at least I've remembered to take a you see how it goes under the piston up there or above the piston it would be in assembled orientation